New Delhi is the most polluted capital city in the world. The air quality is so bad that living here is equivalent to smoking 10 cigarettes a day. As a Formula E racing driver, electric mobility entrepreneur, and UN climate ambassador, I want to understand why things are so bad. What is being done to improve the situation? And what lessons can be learned from those fighting air pollution on the front line? I have a few memories from all the Formula E races I did. Long Beach I won, Malaysia, the victory from Zurich. Degrassi goes around the outside of him. Here comes Degrassi. He is going to make history. Then we have season four, season five, season three. This Mexico win was the one I won this year that I overtook the first place 20 meters from the finish line. Here comes Verline out of the final corner. He is zero. zero. Degrassi wins. <laughs> I went sideways crossing the finish line, crazy, my adrenaline in that moment was insane. And of course, championship winning trophy, which is the most important one, probably the best day of my career, uh, one of the best day of my life. In season one, he was third. In season two, he was second. And in season three, Lucas Degrassi is the Formula E champion. Great job, great job. So great memories. I have a small die cast of my uh, world championship winning uh, car. Yeah, this was generation one Formula E. This was the first ever electric race car produced. To see this car actually being born and then being raced was, uh, uh, was super nice from a vision point of view because I believed in it when nobody did. I always think it's a moral duty to use the knowledge that you acquire in your profession to try to make society better somehow. And I always struggled to understand how motorsport could make society better. Because in the end, like my mom used to say, you go around, 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 and you arrive in the same place. But really with Formula E, was actually when the, I clicked and said, look, this is not, not only fun in motorsport, but it gives a direction uh, for the future to showcase and to push technology towards not only a better future, but cheaper, increased quality of life, so air pollution and global warming, so uh, more efficient ways of transportation, which means less CO2 footprint per person. He's not a regular racing driver. He's really using his platform to explain his ideas to others. He's very interested in, in the world. He wants to, to, to make a difference, uh, making this world a better place to live. I think UN uh, and Formula E has a very good synergy. And uh, since uh, Formula E wants to be um, the benchmark for uh, sustainability is concerned. The UN was very close together with Formula E. They saw there was a good fit to have me as an ambassador. And for me also, uh, it was an honor to be chosen and to accept, uh, uh, to help them to promote and to act on these matters. So Lucas is really concerned about air pollution. We bought a future to put in the home. Now we have a baby, he's gonna breathe this air. It's like, what can we do to, you know, change it a little bit? and he's really concerned about the, um, the quality of uh, the air that he breathes. We have this device now. Um, it's a flow air quality controller that measures PM 2.5, which is uh, particulate matter, 2.5 microns. Basically, you can fit about 20 of these particles in the width of a human hair. So very, very, very small particles 
that goes very deep into your lung. These particles are solid particles, so when they are in your body, they can cause a huge load of harm. These particles exist in nature, but most of them in a, in a city are made by cars, combustion, electricity, cooking. Currently, it's measuring very low levels here. So we are at 19 uh, PM 2.5. It's, it's, it's super reasonable. We understand that 9 million people die a year of uh, diseases directly related to air pollution. Since uh, he joined the uh, UN, he, he became much more aware. He's like researching everything he can, watching all the documentaries that he can, and reading all the books and listening to other books. And sometimes he comes and say like in a statistic from out of nowhere, and it's like, how do you know this? So he he never stops. Yeah, I'm, 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 over a million Indians die prematurely every year due to air pollution. Half of the children in Delhi have abnormalities in their lung. 50%. So it's, it's huge. Having a child, I think, is very... Uh, I, I think it changes a bit your order of priorities. What do I need to do to create a better future for my son, which means a better future for humankind in general. We are very, very fortunate people. We have a very good standard of living. For example, I can install an air filter and keep Leo inside a closed environment mm -hmm. if I want to. But most people cannot afford that. So the people will have the, the, the worst uh, of this scenario in the future will be the less fortunate people and the people who really need the help the most. So for me, this is, uh, this is a key issue. And I think this is where technology can be so disruptive. It can create something which includes more people by being cheaper and better for the environment and for themselves. This is, this is the tricky part. This is what we are all looking for to achieve. This is what electric cars will achieve and electric mobility will achieve in the future. I had a um, first experience in India in 2008. I did a, actually a Formula One uh, demonstration there, and there were like 100,000 people all super excited. So the heat, the, the passion of the Indian people was awesome, but the conditions that I saw there, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. I think he will see a shocking reality. I think this will be good for him to better understand the the size of the problem that he is facing. What I'm looking for is really to see live and feel what billions of people are going through in their day-to-day -day life, how deep is the impact that these technologies are going to have in their lives. Delhi, I met my guide, respected journalist and environmental campaigner, Bahar Dutt. So I know this looks crazy, but uh, it's actually, there's an order to this chaos where in the old cities that this market here is where a lot of the old cars get repaired. So can, can I buy some parts for my Formula E car here or not? I don't think so. No. <laughs> Each of these shops, they have very specific parts. It's like you have the clutch, you have the air conditioning, you have suspensions. So the usage of parts until the very last mile. Actually, look at that damper I can use in one of my former e races. You've come at a very interesting time right now because it's just the onset of what we call the air pollution season. Okay. I don't really understand why air pollution is so bad. Is that because of power generation? Is that vehicles? It's a complex answer. It's not any one cause, yes, yes, which is uh, why finding the solutions is not easy. Of course. So whether it's vehicular emission, or it's our coal-fired power plants, or it's road dust, or crop burning. We 
We have a pretty interesting setup of electric cables here. 72% of our electricity demand comes from coal. Uh, from coal. And coal is extremely polluting. So many inefficient and pollutant, but it's cheap. Exactly. A tough part of it is that a huge population will need access to energy. At the same time, there's also a demand from the Prime Minister. He said that we need to be a $1 trillion economy. How will all this growth be fueled? It will be fueled in the interim till 2030 at least by coal. So there lies the challenge. So, Ba, this is a tuk tuk, right? Yes, it's the uh, e rickshaw, as we yes. call it. And uh, this is electric, right? Yes. Can we see the batteries? I think so. I think the batteries inside battery, the kind yes. Ah, so you have four batteries. So one charging is able to do 80 kilometers. 80? In just one charging. How much it costs? One to Around $2,000. Do you want to buy one? No. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Actually, it would be very cool around my, my hometown. He didn't choose an electric tuk-tuk because it's electric. He chose because it's the best cost-benefit one. The thing with the tuk-tuk and the bicycle is it, it's being used by the poor. Yes. Who were anyways using clean sources of energy, who were using public transport. The challenge is how do we get the people of Delhi who have four cars in one house to say, please give up your cars and move to public transport. With over 10 million cars on Delhi's roads, it's a huge challenge to encourage people to move to cleaner forms of mobility. There's also another transport issue that faces India. Typically, India moves through its trucks. The trucks carry all our essential supplies from construction to milk to vegetables. All these trucks run on diesel. Yeah. And diesel, as we know, emits a lot of PM2.5. And as far as pollution is concerned, 28% comes from vehicles. What's the legislation, the regulation about yes. emissions, trucks? So all of them require a certificate which says pollution under control. But they're supposed to renew it once in every two years. And they don't do it because it's expensive and you need to be on top of the technology. I think what one should remember is, A, that they're poor people, B, that many of them spend their lives on these trucks. So they'll be sleeping in the truck itself every day, covering thousands of kilometers. And we forget that the truck drivers are also hit by the diesel emissions. Yes. So Lucas, I wanted you to meet Shanti. She's a rarity. She's a female mechanic. Oh, very pleasure to meet you. Tell me a little bit the story that brought you here. Apni kani kya jo husband the na, mare wo kam karte the, unke saath ham bhi karte the kam. Ham log kar lete the. Ham ya bivi do ano kam karti. Aur mare jo husband khatam hue na, unko bhi saas ki bimari ho gayi thi. Mitti nahi jati thi mu me. What about your health? How do you feel? स्वास्थ्य में देखो ये उठना बैठना इनमें जो में दर्द होना है सांस लेने में दिक्कत होती है। The aim is to innovative technologies bring the cost of transportation down and at the same time we decrease the amount of pollutants। आप कर सकते हो ऐसी बात नहीं आप कर सकते हो क्यों आप में हिम्मत भी है हिम्मत भी है पैसा भी है तो आप लोग कर सकते हो गरीब आदमी क्या करेगा अगर उसको अभी इस टाइम पे अगर दो रोटी मिल रही है ना तो उसमें उसको तसल्ली है So are you hopeful about the future? Uh, do you see any improvement? No, it's been a long time. It's not good at all. It's not good at all. It's not good at all. Let's see. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck for your future and future of your kids. It's uh, quite an eye-opening place to be. It's very good to sit and talk to people, understand their real needs. They are the worst in exposure to that pollution, and it's not even on the top of their priorities. So a lot of times when, as environmentalists, we're suggesting, don't do this, don't do this. In India, we, I think, forget that everybody has a livelihood of it. So I think it's really important in the air pollution conversation to also bring in social issues and how it affects the poor. And if technologies they don't make for a cheaper, more efficient way of, in this case, transporting goods, it will not be accepted by this population. But if it is cheaper to operate, people will start using it. OK, Lucas, we have to climb up a building today because there's something I want to show you. 
This is a sight to behold. It was meant to be a landfill, it's now a mountain. It's the biggest mountain of trash I've ever seen in my life. There's three more. We have four of those, yes. and the amount of production of garbage per day is... Would be around 11,000 tons per day. And the poorest of the poor will end up there with their bare hands, picking up some of the garbage to recycle. The really poor people are exposing themselves every day to this hazardous waste. Uh, remember, landfills also release methane. Yeah, yeah. So that's combustible, that catches fire. And again, all the people here you're saying, they're inhaling all that. So the levels, just imagine how high it must be, even on an average rainy day of the toxic yeah, actually chemicals. I, measured very the, high. I just measured it was like super high. The people that are most affected by the pollution are the poorest because they eat, sleep, and work outside. Bahar knows a local family she wants me to meet. Okay, Lucas, this is a typical community which would live by the roadside. Hello, hello. Do you have uh, your family? Do they have a lot of uh, problems with the uh, respiratory? What do they use for cooking? She's saying there's smoke not just from the cooking, but also they're a blacksmith community. Wow. One of the big causes of air pollution is open kitchens like this, and the fact that also their occupation involves ingesting yeah. a lot of smoke. Yeah, actually the cooking is the worst for PM 2.5. Exactly. It's actually worse than even the vehicles. She doesn't even know that she's actually living in the most polluted city in the world. What, what is the roadmap for, for the governments to help the families and the people in this state? Politicians don't see it as something getting them votes. Maybe if she were to tomorrow say, I'm not going to vote for you. So I think... So I think... This is completely outside my reality, of course. For them, it's, a, it's a probably the, it's much a bigger problem than ours, but it's still bottom of their list. These people, which are the most impacted, they are not able to stand by themselves and do anything about it. They depend on the air pollution, on the work, on their food, on their shelter. They have to live here, they have no choice. I just put myself and my son in this position and it's a humbling experience. And you feel, you feel so sad just because you cannot do anything about it. There's so many people in such a poor condition. Technology can play a huge part in combating air pollution. And just a few miles from the overpass, there is an office building with some interesting innovations. This is the golden pothose, which is also called the money plant in India. Very easy plant to grow, and it's great at removing formaldehyde from the air. No indoor place will ever have CO2 less than outdoors, because human beings give out huge amounts of carbon dioxide. But here, because of the plants, the CO2 levels are lower than even outdoors. In early 1990s, I became allergic to Delhi's air. We started this research on simple plants which converted CO2 into oxygen very effectively. The Sansevieria, it's an indoor plant which gives oxygen at night and removes carbon dioxide at night. So if you can't have a proper filtration system for outdoor air and fresh air, then you put lots of these in the room and your carbon dioxide levels can come down. And that one? And that's the third one. It's a part of the palm family. This is one of the best plants in giving oxygen during the daytime. We clean up the air, we remove the volatile chemicals, we remove things like ozone, NOx and SOx, etc. We're a 35-year-old building and it can be done here. 
What is this? So this is a cooling tower. For the air conditioning. That's right, part of the air conditioning system. And we also use it for the air quality system where we're able to cool the air in the summertime down to 27 degrees when it's outside is 45 degrees without any air conditioning because of this cooling tower. Evaporation of water. Yes. There's zero artificial light. Ah, this is sunlight. Pure sunlight. So the entire spectrum of the sun's light for photosynthesis is coming through here. The vacuum tube, so you touch it, it doesn't, it's not hot uh, because of the vacuum tube and the mirrors which concentrate the sunlight through into this room. You see those leaves moving over there? Yeah. The air is coming through a mechanical filtration system. All the particulates from outside, all the gases are removed. They're coming into this greenhouse. The plants are getting that air. They're doing their magic. They're making oxygen and reducing the carbon dioxide levels. Yeah. They're also removing the microbiological pollutants, the bacteria and viruses, and that's the root zone eats up the bacteria and the viruses, and the plants become even healthier because of that. And so. From the other side then, it gets pulled out of this room and then goes into every air handling unit in this building. So every person in the building gets a little slice of the greenhouse, a little slice of the, of the, fresh, air. Of the fresh air. Very nice. What, what is the bottles for? We run a business center over here and a lot of our clients don't want the filtered normal water that we have. They want, a, they want bottled water. We're a zero waste uh, facility over here. So all the waste is taken, the dry waste is separated, the bottles are taken and we make planters out of them. So fresh air, fresh, the water, zero waste. After coming to this beauty, I feel very bad. I need, I need to improve my, my standards. It's, it's basically a human right to be able to breathe clean air. And uh, what has been done here, what is incredible is that it, it is a full circle and then this is so easy to be implemented. If it could be done here, it could be done anywhere. The Center for Science and Environment is looking at ways of bringing about change at a national level. In a developing world like India, Environment is not about pretty trees and tigers. It's about the connection between survival of communities and sustainable use of natural resources. Now we are at that turning point. We are seeing citizen science emerging here, people going around with their sensor monitors and seeing how what they are breathing. This conversation is moving action a lot more. This last decade, this city has shut down four coal-based power plants. Delhi has banned all the dirty fuels. But even after doing all these, these are not small measures, we still have to reduce our pollution levels by at least 65% to meet what we define as clean air. And how do you see technology playing a part? Technology has played a dramatic role. This is perhaps the only major vehicle producing country in the world. From after reaching the Euro 4 emission standards, yep. that will skip Euro 5 and go direct to Euro 6 just in three years. And you must have seen this, what we call the e-rickshaws. Yeah, I've ridden in one. Um, I almost died, but in the end, I said to the driver that he has to come and race with me in Formula E. So by 2030, all new vehicles to be electric. That's huge ambition. And in Brazil, they, they want to start discussing about electric mobility in 2030. Um, so hearing that actually makes me very proud of these uh, policies from the Indian uh, government towards uh, electrification of, uh, of mobility in general. It's very different when you have a life like this. It's very easy to say, okay, let's fight air pollution or this or that. Or, But when you go there and you see the reality and see that the, the problem is so much more complex. The biggest challenge that I see in India was how to create economic growth in a sustainable way. Everybody's breathing the same air, but most people suffering are the poor people. I think the adoption of electric cars will change society for much better, but we cannot just regulate and mandate people should drive electric cars. It will need to be cheaper than current technology, so it's accepted. We are already getting better 
off that we were on the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Even there in Delhi, they are ready with good policies, uh, taking uh, coal out, other forms of producing more sustainable uh, mobility and power generation. It's a process. If you have the opportunity and the chance to push technology forward in terms that will make society better, uh, you should do so. We already used motorsport seven, eight years ago to create Formula E, to push electric. This is, for me, very clear. It doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter which country you're for, how much money you make or who you are. I think you should be trying to make society better. There is a, there is a duty for that, for them, actually.